Good evening, everybody. Euh, bonsoir, mesdames et messieurs, et bienvenue à la première séance de la cinquième saison de Recherche en Lumière à l'École de Musique Julie. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the fifth season, uh, the first session of the fifth season of Research Alive at the Schulich School of Music. Uh, my name is Stephen McAdams, and I co-curate this series with Kit Soden, who couldn't be here right now because in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, with this series, we aim to bring alive the humanistic, scientific, and engineering research in music, as well as the research that goes on behind the scenes in performance and composition that leads up to the final product. Uh, each event is given by a faculty or student member of the Schulich School of Music to bring to light their research, amply illustrated with often live musical examples, but today it'll be filmed musical examples. Our next sessions are on November 20th with the improvisational workshop led by Jean-Michel Pilk on piano, uh, who's our first recidivist in this series, and accompanied by Kevin Dean on trumpet and Remy Bolduc on saxophone. And their presentation is entitled Collective Improvisation, The Lifelike Nature of Instant Composition. And then on February 6th, uh, we have two finalist teams in our yearly Research Alive Student Prize competition. Uh, Leonard Pierce and Karin Cuellar Rendon will keep the improvisatory spirit alive, but from a different historical era, presenting Musicking Off the Cuff, Models for Early Music Improvisation. And Hester Bell Jordan will tell us about a notorious lady, uh, Nanetta Streicherstein, and piano making in the early 19th century Vienna. Finally, on March 11th, this season's student prize winner, generously funded by Jill de Villafranca and Dr. David Kustick, is flautist Hannah Derrick who will bring the other side of the world to our stage with cultural convergences, traditional Maori flutes, and contemporary New Zealand classical music. So please come to all of those events as well. This evening's speaker, musicologist Lloyd Whitesell, is the vice dean of the Schulich School of Music. He's the author of The Music of Johnny Mitchell, published by Oxford University Press in 2008. And he's published articles on a vast array of topics, including composers Benjamin Britten, Maurice Ravel, and Charles Ives as well as film music, minimalism, modern tonalities, and the anxiety of influence. An essay collection he co-edited, Queer Episodes in Music and Modern Identity, published by the University of Illinois Press in 2002, won the Philip Brett Award for Excellence in LGBTQ Musicology. His current research explores queer aesthetics by way of important creative personas, such as the monster, the trickster, and the dandy. Uh, his recent book, Wonderful Design, Glamour and the Hollywood Musical, was published by Oxford in 2018, and he'll be drawing from that marvelously written and evocative tome this evening, so please welcome me and joining Chip Whitesell. Glamour is addictive. In Hollywood, Stylists and cinematographers developed an array of enhancement techniques so that visual surfaces would continuously arouse our desire. At the same time, Hollywood music stylists developed their own techniques to create tantalizing sonic surfaces. Today I want to focus on how Hollywood glamour creates desire. But I'll start with a prelude asking you to think about what glamour sounds like. The instrumental ballad, Moonlight Serenade, was recorded by Glenn Miller and his orchestra in 1939 and immortalized as the theme song for the band's radio appearances in the 1940s, molding dreamy sentiment into a glossy ribbon of sound. It was enormously popular with audiences. Many other artists have since covered that tune, but it's the sound of the original recording that sticks in our collective memory as a symbol of the swing era. As jazz critic Gary Giddens explains, Miller's trademark sound remains unmistakable. A clarinet playing lead, supported by closely harmonized saxophones with responses from a large brass section, often muted, and a politely clumping four-man rhythm section. For Giddens, the unique sonority of Moonlight Serenade and its swaying melody pinned to the first beat of the bar evoke a vanished age even for those who never knew the age. What is it about this sound that's so powerfully evocative? It conveys luxuriance in the rich harmonic language and the full reed section with lots of vibrato. 
but its sensuous qualities are held in check in a careful balance of indulgence and moderation felt in many musical dimensions. I'll just mention some. So harmony, there's chromaticism, but the chromatic profusion is contained by ultra smooth voice leading, where internal voices go step by step from chord to chord, just like they each have their own kind of sleek, streamlined path. So the harmony is chromatic, but the melody is actually restfully diatonic with just a few little dissonances. Just every once in a while. As for texture, the voluptuous masses of reed and brass upholster a really simple outline of two melodies that interlock. The rhythm is sedate, understated pulse, reeds squarely on the beat, brass gently swinging. The sustained fullness of sonority connotes opulence at the same time as it connotes composure and restraint. It's the integrated effect that gives the music its timeless allure, that is, its glamour. So let me play phrase two, which is basically the same as phrase one, but you can listen for all those things. After thinking long and hard about glamour, I developed a basic recipe that applies to both visual and musical manifestations. In my view, or my patented view, I could say, something is glamorous when it amalgamates four qualities, sensuousness, restraint, elevation, and sophistication. All four qualities need to blend together into a composite effect. So the Glenn Miller example, oops, there goes my pen, is not just sensuous in its sound, it has a sensuousness that's qualified by restraint. The same would be true for visual forms of glamour. If you have sensuousness without restraint, you won't get glamour, you'll get something else. I'll just briefly mention the other two parameters with, so I don't spend a lot of time on this, elevation and sophistication. You can create a sense of musical elevation uh, one way through light and graceful figures, another way through gestures that draw your attention upward in the pitch space, so like a sweeping harp, etc. In Moonlight Serenade, listen for a special musical accent where the piano kind of riffs upward like a harp at the very end. Sophistication has to do with clever or unexpected elements in the composition, whether harmony, form, or timbre. Miller's distinctive reed sound is sophisticated in creating a composite of clarinet and sax so well blended it's hard to tell what the original ingredients are. Uh, the orchestration of the whole song also follows the sophisticated design of contrast within a very limited palette. The last four phrases each have a unique combination. Uh, there's like muted brass, unmuted brass. There's like different ways that he voices the reed section. So there's uh, block chords and then there's open octaves. So I'm just gonna play two phrases and listen for the change between the first phrase that I play and the second phrase. <clears throat> first you'll uh, hear muted brass and then in the next phrase it'll change to unmuted. First you'll hear reeds and block voicing and it'll change into reeds and open octaves. My recipe for glamour is flexible enough to apply to any number of different musical styles. Keep these four qualities in mind as we consider how they translate into desire. Catherine Hepburn's biographer, William Mann, tells the story of her arrival in Hollywood as a variation on the classic makeover. But rather than surrendering herself willingly to her director, the young Hepburn, who is fresh from success on Broadway, had strong opinions about her own image. This is a quote from the biography. From across his desk, George Cukor stared at this rather pretentious newcomer. And this is actually a picture of what she was wearing that day. Wearing her old money background as obviously as her avant-garde clothes. When he spoke, it was to show Catherine costume sketches. She said, they're all wrong. I think she should be wearing Chanel, she told the director. Oh really, Cukor replied. And what do you think of what you're wearing? She glanced down at her designer suit. I think it's very smart. Well, I think it stinks, Cukor said. We can proceed from there. Asking her, asking her to remove her hat, he saw a face that appeared skeletal with her hair pulled back tightly into a knot. Cukor walked around her, then paused. He undid her hair and let it fall to her shoulders. The light caught flecks of red and gold. Calling in his assistant, Cukor ordered Hepburn's hair cut 
to chin length and washed with egg shampoos. The exchange between star and director represents a clash between two competing systems of taste, one elite, one popular, one based on fine points of haute couture for those in the know, the other on sensual qualities that everyone can see and appreciate. In aesthetic terms, Hepburn's East Coast image conveyed sophistication without sensuousness. In order to satisfy the demands of Hollywood glamour, Hepburn's hair had to be more than just a sign of chic. It had to be an object of fascination. Cukor liberated it, reshaped it, enhanced its body and luster so that its tactile surface could arouse unarticulated desires. In my presentation, I will investigate how sound and image can be shaped and styled to create allure, encouraging specific frames of mind in the viewer. I focus on three specific frames important to glamour's effect, captive attention, the transfiguration of the everyday, and the preservation of distance between the spectator and the object of their fascination. So this is captive attention. In an influential article on the male gaze in film, Laura Mulvey linked cinematic spectacle with fetishism. Quote, the presence of women is an indispensable element of spectacle in narrative film, yet her visual presence tends to work against the storyline to freeze the flow of action in moments of erotic contemplation. She is isolated, glamorous, on display, sexualized. Another scholar, John Ellis, points to a distinction in Mulvey's work between two kinds of looking, one associated with narrative and one with spectacle. Quote, the voyeuristic look is curious, inquiring, demanding to know. That's what is gonna happen, that's the story one. The fetishistic gaze is captivated by what it sees, does not wish to inquire further, but will always stop and become fascinated with this or that detail or display. That's what we want to think about. It's telling that Mulvey focus on, focuses on glamorous spectacle as her paradigm. The experience of fetishism as a perverse form of gratification, that is, displacing desire from a person to a body part, an object, or an image with an overinvestment in surfaces and decor decorative detail, corresponds closely to the consumption of glamour. And an appreciation of the perceptual dynamics of fetishism can help us understand glamour's allure. So I take up the model of the captivated gaze, but with two provisos. First, fetishistic attention can involve hearing as well as vision, and the rapport between observer and object is not limited to erotic desire. First example, after a night of passion, rich widow Vera Simpson, played by Rita Hayworth, wakes in languor. Apart from a brief exchange with her French maid, very glamorous, the entire scene consists of a musical soliloquy. The song's lyrics give us access to Vera's complicated emotions and invite us to identify with her, but an altogether different impulse governs the visual presentation. After an establishing shot of her luxurious bedroom, the camera cuts in to hover directly above the star as if the viewer were in the same bed. From then on, our gaze is fixed on Hayworth's lovely form. Her accessories, fur-trimmed peignoir, high-heeled slippers, are absurdly indulgent. She clothes and unclothes herself for no reason, framed to advantage by various furnishings. First she's in the bed, then she goes to the window, then she goes to a mirror, then she kind of relaxes in a chair, then she takes a shower. <laughs> so she's moving around like a piece of living jewelry from one display case to another. This scene perfectly illustrates Mulvey's conception of the female star as an erotic object, isolated, glamorous, on display, sexualized. For the space of a song, the image creates direct erotic rapport, rapport with the spectator. The musical production enhances this fetishistic treatment. Contact with the beautiful object amplifies across senses with both optical and acoustic channels evoking tactile sensations. 
I hope you can get a sense of that, how listening is intimate and tactile. Vera's voice supplies an unbroken stream of soft sound whose grain can be clearly perceived and savored. An illusion of intimate presence and direct rapport made possible by close miking and the controlled environment of studio recording. The languid tempo, the rubato vocal delivery encourages our luxurious enjoyment of the details as they go by. As for the orchestra, it goes magically between different perceptual roles. Its textures help to, re to render the full impact of Hayworth's physical charms. The tender strings rendering her softness, the sparkling celeste and harp accents her radiant beauty. And in another sense, the orchestra seems to respond to Vera's voice. So in one way, it's sort of uh, rendering, you know, representing her, but in another way, it's sort of uh, dancing with her. Um, mimicking the captive gaze, conforming slavishly to her rubato, with occasional fluttering wind responses as if stirs of excitement. Overall, you could say the musical arrangement composes another ornamental frame for Hayworth's film image, a sonic display case for the audiovisual object. Do you want a shower like that? <laughs> Marilyn Monroe is well known for the heightened fetishism of her performance style. A variety of, of pouts, hyper-expressive eyelids, exaggerated lip movements when speaking, all to draw attention to herself as a luscious surface, and that's just her face. Her erotic charms are front and center in Lazy, a solo with dancing parts for Donald O'Connor and Mitzi Gaynor. Supposedly in rehearsal clothes, she accessorizes her leotard with unusual accents, large dangly earrings, a sash with a huge bow, a chunky bracelet on her forearm. The opening section of the number is snappy and hyperactive, dominated by the dancer's energy. But the moment the chorus begins, when, when she sings, everything changes. All the snap dissolves into a languid pace and a mellow sound. The camera fixes on Monroe, and what we see, when we see the dancers, their poses also express a captivation. Once again, the content of the words is in counterpoint with what you see, this time humorously, because the song originally is not a sexy song, right? But they're turning this song about reading a book <laughs> into a tease. Marilyn drapes herself over a divan, stretching and writhing, pressing her soft contours against the polish of her high heels. Within a restrained aesthetic, she increases the sensuousness of her vocal performance by slurring her pronunciation, lavishing minute fluctuations of tone and vibrato on each melodic detail, as if fondling the pitches as they go by, or fondling our ears with her voice. The mellow brass provides a cushiony support for her singing, just like the divan provides a plush setting for her body. A breathy saxophone, unfurls along with her vocal line in an oral image of two bodies intertwining. The concentrated investment in Monroe's voice and its accompaniment as tactile surfaces encourages us to stroke and savor the sounds as sensuous objects. But as I said before, fetishistic listening isn't always erotic in nature. Eroticism is well in the background in the next example, Doris Day's performance of It's Magic. Her character, Georgia, is out in the town in Havana with Peter, both of whom are concealing their true identities. Georgia is really a nightclub singer hired to impersonate a socialite on an ocean cruise. Could happen. <laughs> this number has been set up to pack a surprise. Previously, we heard Georgia perform two songs, one peppy and one restrained but sunny. Her character we get a sense of as spunky, down to earth, rough around the edges. So we're scarcely prepared for the full blown glamor of this number uh, when she starts to sing in the Havana restaurant. Again, the image reflects a captive gaze in the camera's mesmerized approach to her and the shots of Peter with his eyes locked on her.
Beautifully sweet and light, Day's vocalizing modulates effortlessly between textural qualities, breathy, pure, straight tone, vibrato, sculpting elegant contours in the air. By opening with a chaste, breathy timbre, she draws us in and gradually reveals the ri richer and stronger tones that she can command, while adding subtle, tasteful hints of sensuality in her liquid L's, her little embellishments that she'll use very sparingly, and the plunging portamenti that she uses. I'll play the rest so you can hear. To the eyes, Day is fresh-faced and attractive, but the true fascination of the scene lies in the exquisite grace of her voice. When the Cuban singer joins in with harmony, he adds the final touch to the garnishment framing the beautiful vocal object. So to summarize, fetishistic spectatorship involves a fascination with display, senses captivated by a material surface that offers itself up to extended enjoyment. The emphasis on display and sensual contact is encouraged by clothing and reclothing the entrancing object, arranging it in different poses and settings, occasionally accentuating a distinctive feature, accessory, or arresting mannerism. And I mean not only performers, but musical ideas can be these objects that are clothed and reclothed, exerting a mesmerizing force and offering themselves up to our ears. Transfiguration. Allure doesn't always reside in an object. When Doris Day sings its magic, her voice may be objectified, but her words describe a subjective experience. You sigh, the song begins, you speak, and I hear violins. The stars desert the skies and rush to nestle in your eyes. Her feelings of rapture are strong enough to alter her perceptions. Now, plenty of love songs express excitement without getting into the glamour side of things, but some songs grope in the dark for metaphors of utopia and the supernatural in pursuit of something more ineffable. And here we turn our attention from spectacle to affect. Not only does glamour deal in images of impossible beauty and desirability, it also weaves fantasies of escape and transformation. As Virginia Postrel suggests, she has a really great book on glamour, if you're interested. Glamour's appeal is greater than its pretexts. Quote, glamour doesn't offer simple utility or sensation. It's not that literal. More than important, more important than any specific sensory pleasure is the state of being that gets evoked by a glamorous image. Thus, if you're looking, let's say, at a photograph of a jet plane in flight, it might have glorious rhetoric, glamorous rhetoric to make you not think about the actual experience of flying, but about what that state of being is, uh, is reaching toward. Quote, no matter how many times we've flown, we can still feel the glamour of this image because the fe this feeling isn't about the actual travel experience. It's about soaring towards something new, leaving behind disappointments, flying toward our hopes and our dreams. Likewise, the conventions of heterosexual romance, even if they've been many times warmed over, can give us visions of transfigured existence when we're under glamour's spell. Such glimpses of heightened well-being, where things seem to align perfectly and their virtues shine through, never last very long as a rule. A still photo can freeze a precarious moment into a timeless, a timeless ideal. Music can sustain euphoria for a little while, but the experience of exaltation is always colored by transience. Glamour seduces by promising us bliss condensed into an instant. Music contributes to such fantasies by way of different tropes evoking different exalted states of being or emotional responses to good fortune. First, the trope of specialness. Since any music added to a film scene makes it stand out as special, glamorous music must be surpassingly special in the context of a world, a film world that's already full of music. Unusual timbres and textures come into play. When Lady and Tramp, in this animated Disney film, follow their spaghetti dinner with a romantic stroll in the moonlight, we switch from accordion music in the alleyway 
to an a cappella choir with, with silken textures. So they had to find, okay, we need a special timbre, a special texture to convey transfigured emotional states. Another trope evokes an effect of fullness or an increase of being. This impression can arise from intensely sweet and lush sonorities. The opening drag act from Priscilla, Queen of the Desert gives us a camp take on this trope. So the point is especially that climax, because already the this, this song is very saccharine, but when you get to that high point, then all of a sudden it's exaggeratedly sweet in the vocal timbre and the register and the harmony, as if trying to just squeeze a, a whole bunch of pleasures into a little drop of nectar. Fullness can also be conveyed by lyrical abundance. When Barbara Streisand sings People, she withholds the use of full voice except for carefully planned moments of release. I won't play the whole thing. And I just want to point out that there's also fetishism going on there. You see Omar Sharif captively staring at her. She fondles the railing. <laughs> and of course, her, uh, her vocal display is, is very fetishistic as well. Musical features expressing suaveness and elegance contribute to a sense of grace. Fred Astaire's work would be rich with such examples. Near the beginning of the film, Easter Parade, he dances with Ann Miller, attempting to prevent her from leaving their act. And this one, you can also listen for my parameter of elevation, that is lightness and gracefulness and upward impulses. So somehow the arrangers make this song sound lighter than air. The rhythmic pulse is hardly discernible. In certain phrases, strum on the harp demarcates the four bar spans of phrases, but lo there's long stretches where you don't hear punctuation at all. The emphasis is on floating textures, wafting lines, often upwardly wafting. The first phrases of the tune, the A phrases, pause at the end of these upward contours. So what is this supposed to uh, embody, first of all, the attunement between these two characters, the it that he's talking about, the it that only happens uh, with, between them. But on another level, it renders for us, the viewer, what it must feel like to be Fred Astaire, to have that effortless elegance. Moments of grace seemingly remove our everyday constraints, fueling fantasies of dexterity and perfect synchronization. To reflect heightened well-being, music sometimes directly conveys emotional exhilaration. You might think of the melodic outbursts in My Fair Lady, I Could Have Danced All Night. At other times, characters exhibit a more subdued reaction, lapsing into wonder at their good fortune. Wonder overtakes the young lovers of West Side Story in their balcony duet as part of an unfolding sequence of tropes of transfiguration. After one chorus, it conveys exhilaration. A second chorus begins in a hush of wonder with harp and tremolo strings before regaining momentum and then reaching a climax of fullness. So we'll hear wonder, but then it'll move out of the hushed wonder into something else. Did you see the, the selfie framing there from <laughs> before? <laughs> But they're up before it's time. Okay, my third frame of mind is distance. Glamour must tantalize the viewer by both promising and withholding gratification. Evocations of bliss, opulence, and sensual contact are tempered by devices of restraint and remoteness. According to Peter Bailey, distance is crucial to glamour's allure. Quote, distance not only sustains and protects the magical property that we commonly recognize as glamour, but it also heightens desire through the tension generated by the separation of the glamour object and the beholder, a separation that functions to limit the expression or consummation of desire. 
So this mechanism gets used in commodity display all over the place where we're very used to it. The storefront window allows us to glimpse an idealized arrangement of goods whose value is intensified by our exclusion from that space. In considering how music takes part in such symbolic distancing, helping to lift the object beyond reach, I will touch on three areas of representation, aloofness in performance, exotic or exclusive milieus, and perceptual mystery. In The Merry Widow, the 1934 version, Jeanette MacDonald, as Sonia, wealthiest woman in Marshovia, makes her first solo appearance on a castle balcony in a negligee, lured by the strains of gypsy music from a neighboring tavern. Scrupulous in her enunciation and impeccably controlled, her operatic singing style expresses an advanced level of cultural refinement. Her exaggerated care over the aesthetic qualities of her utterance creates an impression of profound, even unnatural composure. The heightened artifice and supreme self-containment exhibited by Sonia, in contrast to the common citizens on the ground, identifies her as a different order of being. Okay, so Sonia's balcony is completely inaccessible to the rest of us, except the camera ignores that. And so we get to peer into her boudoir and we get to perch over her shoulder. The music conjures an element of mystery just before she appears and as she disappears at the end. At first, the gypsy musicians are absorbed in their own playing until an unsettled passage whose tremolando textures and modulation heralds a change. When she breaks into song, the gypsies flock to the window as though this was a rare privilege to see her. At the end, her voice climbs into the stratosphere and fades from earshot as she retreats into her secret world, a small figure glimpsed in the distance. The competing impulses of fetishized sensory display and figurative separation are calculated to render her presence both touchable and transcendent. The film Velvet Goldmine updates this diva characterization in the context of 1970s glam rock with its depiction of pop idol Brian Slade based on David Bowie. We first glimpse the rock star preparing for a grand entrance dressed in clinging silver lame and sporting a showgirl style collar of oversized feathers. On stage, his gestures and facial expressions suggest an, ar an arrogance more cruel than Jeanette McDonald's benevolent uh, distance. Throughout the film, the costume design for the Slade character evokes a treasure trove of fetishism, featuring skin tight and revealing outfits, extravagant makeup, and kinky gender fluid accessories. At the same time, his image is steeped in remoteness with allusions to lonely space travel, fairy tale motifs given a queer twist. After an assassination attempt interrupts the first grand entrance, we flash back, and that's what I'll play for you, to an earlier performance in his career, a self-centered homage to a grand personality. So my point is I'm trying to show you another example of aloof performance, but in this context. So in the rock context, his pronunciation is very posh. His restrained vocal production comes across as going into high style. Plus, there's a suggestion of mystical otherworldly origins in the sequence leading into this, where you have this sort of floating camera and all that, uh, uh, that poetic narrative, where the fans are looking up at the sky. So just like we saw the gypsies looking up in the, the previous one. And that's Oscar Wilde uh, quotation about an unknown land full of strange flowers and subtle perfumes. In general, elite styles as well as qualities of restraint in performance contribute to an aura of aloofness, helping to maintain a symbolic separation from the audience. Now I want to turn to exoticism. And of course, we all know music can evoke strange and distant lands. This is a very familiar trope. The following number, Caribbean Love Song, combines aloofness and exoticism. Tony Martin is the singer. He sings in a highly polished style. And the showgirl, Hedy Lamar is so self-contained as to be inert. So, so I 
just mention some things about aloofness, but of course we can talk about all the exotic uh, musical features, the undulating textures, the sinuous melody, the modal coloration. So that helps to pull us into fantasy. Music can also enhance an atmosphere of exclusivity, say in a nightclub or a society ball, where glamorous dance strains form part of the ambience of wealth and luxury. In My Fair Lady, a Viennese waltz accompanies Eliza Doolittle's transfigured debut at the embassy, the grandiose and dazzling musical strains exuding old world prestige. In scenes like these, luxuriant music acts like a velvet rope, allowing a glimpse of, yet cordoning us off from, a world whose riches and status lie beyond our experience. The same can be said of the non-diegetic music we heard in Bewitched, Bothered, and Bewildered, my first film example, where the viewer is trespassing into the private rooms of a fabulously wealthy woman. Here, music incarnates the imagined delights of the flesh while reinforcing the opulence and inaccessibility of the milieu. A final aspect of the distancing effect consists in the element of mystery surrounding the experience of glamour. In the non-musical film, Separate Tables, Rita Hayworth plays a Manhattan socialite who breezes into a seaside hotel in Bournemouth, England, her elegance outshining the comfortable uh, setting. When she arrives by taxi, the residents are gawking at the window, rabid with curiosity. Her entrance coincides with a burst of glamorous music in high contrast to the score that we've heard so far. So this renders the stunning effect that she is having on the observers. So there's a very quick flash of glamor there. And there's a lot of things that are sort of packed into that musical moment, but I want to highlight the enigmatic quality that comes from how different it is from its context. That we've been hearing this kind of bouncy music and all of a sudden, ooh, that, that glamour sound, it's very mysterious, it's surprising, surprisingly intense, lustrous, and special. One sonic sensation bristles with a multitude of questions. Where does she come from? How does she carry that off? What is it like to be her? And what is she doing in a place like this? <laughs> All these questions register a mystifying difference between mortals and paragons. The greater the mystery, the more unbridgeable the gap. By leaving details obscure and origins unexplained, symbolic distance is enhanced. One final example features enigmatic motivic relations for the music theorists in the audience. This duet from The Sound of Music springs from the first confession of love between Maria and the captain. The preceding scene outside the gazebo as they fumble to clarify their emotions is blanketed by quiet music, occasionally revealing a salient figure expressive of wonder. Muted strings, a slow pulsing rhythms, ba 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 ba, and a pair of chords in alternation. To be specific, A flat add six, and a G triad over an A flat pedal, which is a tonic diminished add seven. Two tunes appear on and off over these chords. One is the title tune, the hills are alive. And the other one is the beginning of a new tune, which will become the duet tune, something good. As soon as Captain Von Trapp confesses his love, an especially full and poignant version of this pulsing figure with those two chords unfolds. So soon after this, the duet begins, adopting the pair of chords as its opening harmonic progression. The motivic discourse in this passage that we heard reveals a hidden connection between Maria's opening, opening soliloquy on the mountain and the present duet. Though the tunes themselves are unrelated, both begin with the same chord progression. Once you bring this connection to light, what are we to make of it? The song, The Sound of Music, ostensibly expresses Maria's love of nature and her free spirit, even her joy in solitude, with no obvious relevance to the themes of something good. But if we go beneath the surface, we perceive that Maria's soliloquy uses the metaphors of nature and music to express an open-ended yearning which she doesn't fully understand and which will find its fulfillment on acceptance into her new family. 
Thus, the music leading up to this duet highlights the wonder figure as a narrative pivot of special symbolic weight, recalling Maria's unformed youth, looking into her unknown future, and making a veiled link between the two, which causes us to reflect on the ways of God who mysteriously closes doors and opens windows. In a brush with glamour, these three frames of mind that I've told you about, fetishism, transfiguration, and distance, fuse into a complex texture affecting the spectator's relation to the sounding image. For one thing, the desires that it awakes in us are inchoate. When George Cukor glamorized Hepburn's hair, he made it into a, perf a potent symbol, but of what? Beauty, luxury, erotic charm, flair, discrimination, easy living, all these things. The glamour doesn't consist in the represented object, but in the stylistic enhancement that arouses desire. In fact, arouses an indeterminate mass of desires, which it's up to the object to try to pin down as best it can. What do we want to do with that fascinating hair? Touch it? Devour it with our eyes? Emulate its stylishness? Project ourselves into the special world it belongs to? Glamour is less a known set of fantasies than a stimulant, a form of rhetoric which gives us pleasure even as it heightens our yearning. Glamour's affective texture is also contradictory, pitting illusions of intimate contact against reminders of inaccessibility. One side or the other of this paradox can come to the fore. Thus, when we seem to be lounging in bed with Rita Hayworth, physical intimacy is the overtone and her exclusive lifestyle the undertone. But when Madame Sonia of Marshovia deigns to appear on her lofty castle balcony in intimate attire, the values are re reversed. But the underlying tension is always there between the lure of consummation and the barrier still to be crossed. To be precise, the affect of glamour involves a horizontal structure. We achieve a special vantage point that promises better things made more seductive due to the receding nature of the promise. Musical numbers and their symbolic separation from realistic environments can act as imaginary windows onto horizons of perceptual mystery and bewitchment. Their dazzling visions beckon all the stronger as they continue to elude us. Thank you. Questions? I'll take questions if, if anyone. There's no microphone out there, so you'll just have to <coughs> speak loud. Yes, Nicole? Thanks so much. What a lot of eye candy and ear candy. Um, <laughs> I was really struck actually by the cinematography in your first example, the Rita Hayworth example, because it seemed to be different from all of the later ones. Uh, like Marilyn Monroe, the camera was focused mostly on her body, and Doris Day mostly on her face. But uh, with Hayward, like first she's in the bed and she's covered, and then she gets up and she's looking through the shutters, and then she's looking through the lace curtain, and then she's looking through the mirror, and then she's in the sh It's like this kind of burlesque peekaboo, you know? And uh, it's such a tease. And uh, I wondered if that was maybe kind of a halfway form of your principle of aloofness, but the other thought I had about that was maybe it's because all of the other characters that you've given us examples from have, audience, have diegetic audiences. And she's the only one who's completely alone, so maybe that's sort of meant to enhance our sense of the gaze. I, I, I was just interested if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, that's really interesting. <clears throat> There's so many ways they can do things. So <clears throat> that's just, you're just pointing out a really nice, uh, you're just being very observant about how the framing, how they can do all these, and unless you're sort of, tuned into it, you might not even notice what she's doing, but, but I guess that's pretty indulgent, especially when you get to the shower. That kind of hexagonal, <laughs> it looks like a diamond, you know, like a faceted diamond. So they really are finding, you know, multiple, multiple redundant ways of objectifying her, 
partly through this framing, uh, which is very odd because like I mentioned, the song is not about that at all. The song is like, you know, we're listening to what she's, her feelings, and yet what we're seeing is completely something else. Uh, but there's just so many, that's why I wanted to show a lot of examples. There's just many, many ways that cinematographers and designers figured out how to do that. And sometimes you can have a diegetic audience, but it's, it's not, you don't really notice, like Omar Sharif in People. Like he's sort of there, but you don't really, you know. Basically, she's singing a soliloquy. She's just, you know, like, why is he even there? He's just, oh, you know, uh, chatter, chatter, chatter. All of a sudden, she starts going, you know, people. Like, she starts philosophizing. <laughs> there's no reason for him to be there. So, so there's very artificial and weird things that can happen. Lars? Uh, so you, all the examples here are from, like, 1934 to 1998 or something like that. Is, would you say glamour is from this period, or is it is there glamour in 19th century opera? Is it is it something that came with the, with the, with cinema? Uh, okay, so there's different uh, there's uh, glamour historians, and some of them have different views. So one um, uh, kind of the first glamour historian, his view was that it started with bourgeois. Uh, kind of social mobility, so like Napoleon. In other words, like, instead of having aristocratic, uh, you know, your aristocratic quality is given by birth. It's like, no, it's, Napoleon is a self-made man, and so he has to display his uh, excellence and magnificence. So that's his theory, but then there are people who say, no, you can find glamour in the ancient world because they glamorized military, uh, uh, quality, military achievements and honor. It was a, it's a sort of, they wanted to have a mystique. So there's, there's also a glamorizing of beauty. So uh, Virginia Postrel is the one that talks about the ancient world and she says we have Venus and we have Achilles as two very glamorous figures with the rhetoric of, you know, people, you know, will die for these figures and that kind of a thing. Um, but then cinema historians point out that, you know, the cinema is more glamorous maybe than opera, you know, just, so I don't, I haven't actually thought about is, you know, what the connection is there. Why, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, no? <laughs> but also I wanted to, my uh, ideas to be flexible enough so they can apply in different idioms. So there could be operatic glamour and then cinematic glamour and then obviously cinematic glamour is uh, phasing into pop music glamour. You can have pop music glamour without the image, so that um, you know you could be listening to a recording of any of these things and still have the the glamour quotient be up there. One thing that occurred to me is the uh, in Ireland, the, the Gilbert and Sullivan, the, the peers come in, mm -hmm. and they're, it's a clearly it's, a, it's it's glamour, I think, but it's a takeoff on glamour because they're they're uh, it's so obviously that they're trying to be wonderful and so just in case you didn't hear he's talking about iolanthe by gilbert and sullivan yeah yeah and so there's a the house of peers comes in and they say bow bow you you you, you tradesmen bow ye masses <laughs> and uh uh and the music is very pompous and very funny you know so it's, it's not glamorous because it's too funny but it's uh but it's taking it's, it's shooting up glamour, glamour. right another funny thing that happens in hollywood films is you'll get classical music uh, coming in. You know, you're, like most of the score will be popular music, then all of a sudden there'll be a ballet, and then that's, oh, that's more, you know, maybe glamour is part of it, but it's also like elite and that kind of thing. So uh, the um, uh, film The Bandwagon has Fred Astaire and Sid Charisse, she's a ballet dancer, and he is, you know, a popular dancer. And they have to try and work things out, and you first see her in the context of a modernist ballet. And so it's glamorous, but it's also off-putting, and so there's all, there's all kinds of nuances that can, can happen with these uh, semantics. Bill? And following up a little bit on Nicole's idea of the um the temporality associated with all of the motion in that first clip that you played. And then, the yeah, huh? yeah. but really, as, as you pointed out, many of the other uh, scenes are extremely static and inert. I was really struck by that, especially the one at West Side Story. Oh, okay. 
end of the West Side Story clip, and then I started to think that I, I've often thought of glamour as particularly associated with still photography. The Glamour magazine, um, I think even a magazine is called Glamour, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, one of the fashion magazines. And that's not a temporal, or it's not overtly temporal. And I'm wondering if there's something about, even though the, the two art forms that you talk about are, are, are truly temporal forms, cinema and music, but I'm wondering how this may play into well, a so <coughs> So another historical flashpoint that's in the theater would be the uh, review. So the Follies, so the Broadway Follies style, uh, uh, where you have a lot of it just, you know, so you'll have a variety of acts, but then the climax will be a procession of beauty, beauteous women, you know. So you'll have the, the chorus of dancers, and then you'll have the showgirls. And the chorus is dancing energetically, and the showgirls are posing and walking very slowly. So they're not static, but they're restrained and disciplined. And they'll often be wearing, you know, very, uh, you know, they have to balance all their feathers, et cetera. But they're just, they had the cultivated walk that they had to do. So you can find uh, temporal ways of, of having discipline and restraint. Um, that's what, you know, I've been listening to all this music and trying to think it's, it's happening in time, but somehow it's still trying to, you know, it's still trying to have a sense of things are contained. That's what I love about that Glenn Miller because it's like, what is it about that Glenn Miller that is just, like it's very sweet and sensuous, but also it's just so contained. It just seems like it won't break, you know? There it is and it's always gonna be the same, so. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Thank you.